Good morning, News Story. I can't be there this morning. I am somewhere in the Mediterranean following along the Apostle Paul's journeys and exploring the different sites there with Leah Darwin. But today, I get to introduce to you Duffy Robbins, who will be speaking this morning. Duffy is a professor at Grove City College. He's a friend. He's actually a famous conference speaker, has spoken all over the world. And he's just a genuine, good human being who deeply loves Jesus. Please give a warm news story welcome to Duffy Robbins. Thank you so much. What a pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, I, I, first of all, apologies for those of you who came hoping to hear Paul Anderson. Uh, and instead, the guy stands up as a, a guy special prosecutor, probably described as a well-meaning elderly man uh, with a poor memory. But uh, I am delighted to be here. In fact, uh, I am um, a resident of Phoenixville for many years before I moved to the western side of the state. We live just down the street on Tinker Hill Road. And we used to actually attend Grace Valley when we met over at the middle school. So uh, being here this morning is a little bit like uh, a little bit like coming home. Great, great to be back. Actually, I want to start off this morning with a little bit of a question, a little bit of survey. Uh, how many of you uh, have ever? Uh, how many of you know what it means to have a a DTR talk? Anybody know what it means to have a DTR talk? Okay. Um, would you mind just, you could just kind of yell it out, just really loud. What does it mean to have a, a DTR talk? Yes, your wife is scolding you now for. Define the yeah, define the relationship. Define the relationship. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, the Urban Dictionary uh, actually defines a DTR conversation as a conversation when two people discuss their mutual understanding, note that word mutual, mutual understanding of a romantic relationship. So they, dis- they define the relationship. So it's like, okay, are we dating? Uh, are we just, you know, are we just hanging out? Are we boyfriend and girlfriend? Are we exclusive? Uh, does this mean from now on you're, you're buying my meals? Uh, are, you, uh, are you breaking up with me? Are you giving me a ring? Uh, do we have three kids and a mortgage? Uh, you know, that, that's a define the relationship conversation. Just out of curiosity, how many of you have ever had a DTR conversation? Let's see a show of hands. Oh, great. Would you mind coming up and sharing your... No, just kidding. But no, th- those, uh, <laughs> those uh, conversations can be a little bit uh, interesting. Actually, uh, my wife Maggie and I, uh, last May 2023, that was our 50th anniversary. And so we were having a little bit of a... Uh, Oh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. That, that sounded like a fish in a deep fat fryer. But, uh, but yeah, we were having a, a DTR conversation. That made me hungry for lunch. And uh, anyway, we were sort of laughing about the fact that we've, we've you know, uh, we were so young when we got married. And now, <clears throat> you know, here we are all these years later. Uh, I mean, we literally started getting Social Security benefits last year. And, uh, and we still like each other a lot. And, and, and I said, yeah, you know what that, that means? That means we are literally friends with benefits. So, uh, yeah, it, it, when you define the relationship, it gives you a chance to kind of think through what the relationship looks like. Most of you probably are aware of the fact that we are this week right in the heart, right in the heart of Lent. Now, now Lent um, is a season of reflection. It's a season of confession, anticipation. Uh, and what that means is that it is a time... Uh, for us to kind of think in the Lenten season about how this Sunday and next Sunday the Bible defines a relationship with Jesus. How does the Bible define a relationship with Jesus? And reflect on how we can, by the Spirit's power, oh, Clint, I see you're, okay. Clint is saying that, wait a minute, your media is not on. All right, Let's, uh, let's close in prayer. No, actually, uh, it, it, uh, it, I think it is appropriate on this Sunday morning in Lenten season to say, okay, well, let's, let's reflect then on our relationship with Jesus and, of course, on how we might, by the power of the Holy Spirit, deepen that relationship with Jesus. So what's going to happen this Sunday morning and next Sunday morning is we're going to look at two separate passages uh, in the ninth chapter of the Gospel of Luke. We're going to use those passages as a lens through which to think about our own relationship with Jesus. We're going to begin this morning with a passage uh, where we see, frankly, in very stark and and serious terms, that Jesus is having a 
define a relationship conversation with his own disciples. So if you have a, if you have a Bible, turn with me, please, to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. We're going to begin reading in verse 18. Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 18. How do we define a relationship with Jesus as his disciple? Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 18. Now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. And he asked them, who do the crowd say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. But others say, Elijah. And others, that one of the prophets of old has written. Then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God. Verse 21, he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, <clears throat> excuse me, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory, in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Uh, it, it's been an exhilarating journey for uh, the disciples. Um, back in the opening verses of chapter 9, Jesus has summoned all 12 disciples uh, together and told them they're going to be sent out <clears throat> to proclaim the kingdom of God. And, and, and then with this commission uh, still ringing in their ears, they share uh, in what must have been a, a stunning miracle in verses 10 to 17 of Luke chapter 9, where you'll recall Jesus feeds 5,000 people with, with, with five loaves of bread and two fish. And then uh, it all kind of comes into this amazing crescendo in this stunning conversation in verse 18. In verse 18, when Jesus asks the disciples, who do the crowds say that I am? Who, who do the crowds say that I am? And honestly, it's kind of fascinating when you look at this because <clears throat> you can sort of tell in the text that, that the disciples aren't exactly sure. They're not exactly sure, which I, I don't know about you, but I find kind of encouraging. I, I, it always makes me feel a little bit better about my own doubts and, and my own questions when I come up on a scene like this where Jesus asks the disciples a question uh, and, and, and frankly, they don't seem to have a clue you know, what's, what's going on. And, and you can see this in, in verse 18. Jesus asks the disciples, who do people say that I am? And you can just see it's kind of this um, awkward moment where the disciples are kind of staring, you know, at their feet. You know, you know I don't know. Um, <clears throat> some say Elijah. Some say John the Baptist. Some say Gandalf. You know, some say Jonathan Rumi. I mean, they're, they're just sort of this, this general confusion. They're not really sure. And, and Jesus goes, oh, oh, okay, okay. But here's the real question. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And, of course, Peter, who's always willing to, to speak up, declares, oh, you are the Christ of God. You are the Christ of God. And immediately, and we know this from Matthew's account of this very same conversation in Matthew chapter 16, verse 17, that Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven heaven. Holy cow. I mean, this, this is an amazing, amazing. Try to imagine the wonder, uh, the, 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 the shock of kind of this moment. The disciples have just heard Jesus for essentially the very first time in the clearest possible terms say, yes, I am the Christ of God. I am the Messiah. The Messiah. I remember Paul last Sunday morning talked about this, citing that, that passage in, in Isaiah about a coming Messiah, M Mashiach, the anointed one. And, and here's Jesus telling the disciples, that's me. That, that's, that's me, the Christ of God, that's me. I mean, this is, this is uh, exciting stuff. I mean, the disciples uh, are, are sort of having 
uh, it's sort of this mountaintop moment, right? Because, because they're like, oh my gosh, we're sent out. Uh, Jesus is the Messiah. Uh, you know, we get free bread and fish every time we want it. And, 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 and come in, guys, a group hug. Uh, let's do a selfie. Uh, Judas, would you take the picture? And, and, and there's just this sense of kind of wonderment. There's just a sense of, oh, wow, it's, it's, it's happening right before our very eyes. And then, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, Jesus kind of kills the moment because he says, uh, okay, guys, um, but before we go any further, we probably need to have a define the relationship talk. We probably need to talk about what it means to be my disciple. And, and let me just stop here and say that, uh, that uh, especially in this Lenten season, I think, you know, Jesus were here this morning. And he heard our songs and, and, and he was attending to our prayers and listening to our hearts and, and knowing our, our thoughts. He would probably say something very similar to us, right? I mean, that's part of the power of Lenten season. It gives us space to reflect. It gives us an opportunity for self-examination and confession because for Jesus, for Jesus, authentic discipleship always comes back to this question, who do you say that I am? Not your church. Not your family members, not your youth group, not, not your membership, but who do you say, who do you say that I am? And if you want to be my disciple, what does that really mean? What does that really mean in your life? How do you define that relationship? Which brings us then to these sobering words on which we're going to focus this morning in verse 23. Jesus says, Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Jesus is basically saying to the disciple, you say that I am the Messiah. And you're right about that. You're absolutely right about that. But now we need to talk about what that means. We need to, we need to define that relationship. And with this one verse, with this one verse, Jesus gives us a very vivid picture of, of what it means to be his disciple. What does it mean to, to follow him? Beginning in verse 23, Jesus defines a discipleship relationship really in terms of two big ideas. And the first big idea is this. Jesus basically wants us to understand that to be his disciple is to deny yourself, is to deny yourself. It seems kind of crazy. It seems kind of backwards, but, uh, but Jesus explains, in essence, that discipleship is a magnificent yes wrapped up in a very real no. Discipleship is a magnificent yes wrapped up in a very real no. It was May 20th, 1973. Uh, that, was, that was the date that I got married. And um, my wife, Maggie, uh, who got married the same day. We had been dating uh, for three years, and, um, and I became a Christian my freshman year of college. Immediately, uh, immediately I began to realize there were things that were going to have to change in my life. We're going to have to reorder uh, priorities and, and desires, and so I started asking God to give me a Christian girl to date, and, and many was the night. I would just kneel at my bed and say, God, you know, give me a spirit-filled fox. And, uh, and <clears throat> she must have been praying the same thing. And so, and, and so uh, now we've been dating for three years, and it's our wedding day. Why, why all the laughter? And, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and I know most of you are married. Some of you aren't. But, but, you know, I don't care how much you think about and anticipate and wonder about marriage. There's something about that ceremony that really focuses them. I mean, for me, for me, it happened, it happened with all that thought and everything. It didn't really hit me, the, 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 I guess, the gravity of the relationship until uh, I was in the front of the sanctuary standing with my friends and my dad, and uh, she entered the back of the room, and the music started. And everybody stood up, and that's when it's like, oh, boy, there's, there's going to be a wedding in here. And you're, you're playing a key role in it. And, and it just hit me that this is going to be a big deal. It's not like the prom. Like, you're going to return a tux and keep the girl. And, and I remember uh, she started down the aisle. 
all of a sudden I start thinking about the, uh, the weight of this decision or the import of this decision, that, that I was getting ready to make a decision that would affect every other decision of my life. And, uh, and, and that was the point at which she starts down the aisle. And, of course, you know that tradition that the, the, the bride doesn't see the groom on the day of the wedding, right? Because she, she might change her mind. And I remember, I remember uh, she was about 30 feet from me. It was a center aisle. But it was the first time our eyes made contact. It was the first time I'd seen her that day. And, um, you know, maybe I'm, just, maybe I'm just mushy. I don't know. Maybe I'm just emotional. But honestly, when I saw her, uh, tears started rolling down my cheeks because I started thinking about all the other women that were going to miss out. Yeah, I realize in just a minute, I'm saying yes to this woman. And if this yes is a genuine yes, if it's an authentic yes, then in some ways, in some sense, it's going to be no to every other woman on the planet who's not this woman. It was a magnificent yes, but it was going to have to be protected, ratified, fortified by some genuine no's. And Jesus is saying, basically, look, you know what? If you want to follow me, if you want to follow me, if you want to say yes to me, if you want to be my disciple, that's a magnificent yes. But that magnificent yes comes wrapped in a very genuine no. In fact, think about this. Uh, just a few chapters later in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus says this. If anyone comes to me and does not, does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, you know, some of you may be sitting here and go, well, that's awesome. That's right, because I'm, I'm halfway there. I already hate a bunch of those people. But, 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 of course, Jesus is not saying you're supposed to hate your father and your mother and your brother and your sister. And, oh, don't forget your wife. Jesus is not saying that. He, you're supposed to love those people. What he's saying is, compared to the love you have for me, every other love in your life, no matter how appropriate it might be, it should look like hatred by comparison. It looked like hatred by comparison. What, what he's basically saying is that, uh, is that look, you want to say yes to, to, to sports? That's awesome. Uh, to politics, uh, you know, go for it. To a boyfriend or a girlfriend, excellent. To success in your career, to, to, to getting a thousand likes on your Instagram post, that's great. But discipleship means that we never let the yes we say to that stuff get in the way of the yes we say to Jesus. Because genuine discipleship is a magnificent yes, but it's wrapped up in some very real no's. Jesus says you have to deny yourself. And actually the Greek verb there uh, is a very strong word. It, it, means, it means almost literally forget that you exist. Forget that you exist. Uh, cease to consider your own interest in the slightest degree. And, of course, we don't have to go back 2,000 years to understand the weight of that statement because we are, let's be honest, we are a culture that celebrates and elevates the self above all else, right? Some of you remember uh, back in, um, back in um, I guess, 2014, uh, there used to be sort of a, a, a promotional campaign where uh, Starbucks uh, began to talk about Oprah Winfrey's Steep Your Soul collection of cup holders. Uh, the, the little cup sleeves for your cup of coffee. Steep your soul cup holders. And, and they offer these little kind of pithy, uh, inspirational proverbs that would boost your spirits, buoy your uh, you know, spirits while you're having your cup of coffee. And, and I'm going to read a few of these. See if you can pick up uh, a common theme. These are all proverbs from the, the great one herself. Uh, so first of all, your life is big. Keep reaching. Live from the heart of yourself. Seek to be whole, not perfect. The only courage you ever need is the courage to live the life you want. You are here not to shrink down to less, but to blossom into more of who you really are. How about this one? Pretend you're rich. Buy one of our $6 lattes. I made that one up. Uh, here's another. This is my, my favorite. <clears throat> Be more splendid. Be more extraordinary. Use every moment to fill yourself up. Use every moment to fill yourself up. This is what the philosopher Charles Taylor describes as expressive individualism. 
It is one of the primary afflictions of our current age. Expressive individualism. And it sounds very much like what the prophet Isaiah was talking about when he wrote in Isaiah chapter 53, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. His own way. I always say one of the best ways to describe sin is just to spell out the word sin. S-I-N. And then circle the center letter I. Because that's the heart of the problem. I put myself, my, my big, splendid, extraordinary life right at the core of everything. My desires, my intuitions about reality, my preferences, my needs, my sense of how fast you ought to be driving in the passing lane. I basically, it's me, myself on the throne of my kingdom. But men and women, the life God calls us to is not mapped out in the kingdom of the self. Because God, God it doesn't call us to a big, fabulous life. Ten miles wide, one inch deep, God calls us to an abundant life, an abundant life. It's not about living large. It's about living fully. It's about living fully. It's a new kind of life with a new kind of kingdom, with a new kind of king on the throne, and that king is not us. It's not us. So we live fully into that amazing yes by dying fully into some very real no's. Uh, I, I, you know, some of us don't like the sound of that. I was speaking at a, at a high school conference a few years ago on the eastern shore of Maryland. And uh, there were four sessions, four main sessions. Uh, this was the Saturday night session. I did the evening talk. And, and now it's free time for the kids who are there. And there are about 1,500 high school students in this big hotel. So some of them were in the, they had an indoor pool. They had an indoor volleyball court. Uh, some of the groups were actually meeting to kind of talk about and process, uh, you know, the, the, the session. Uh, and then some of the kids were just hanging out, just, just having free time to talk. Anyway, I was down there in the lobby, <clears throat> and this leader walks up to me, and you could tell she's stressed. I mean, you could just see the, you know, the furrowed brow. And, uh, and she walks right directly up to me and says, Duffy, I need your help. She said, I'm meeting with my students upstairs. We're meeting in, in our group, and we're talking about what you said tonight in your session. And, and, and a lot of the kids are kind of uncomfortable, and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and there, was some, there were some feelings and, 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 and sort of some heated discussion. And I said I'd be willing to ask if you'd come up and answer some of their questions personally. And she said, would you be willing to, to come up and meet with my students? And I said, of course. I said, sure. let me, I said let, me, let me finish my cigarette. I'm just kidding. But anyway, so I get up there, and um, when I walk into the room, it's like just a typical youth group set, just, just wall-to-wall adolescents. I mean, just there are kids on every surface in the room, on the beds, between the beds, next to the television, in front of the TV, on the sink, under the sink, one guy's on the toilet. I mean, they're basically just everywhere you look, there are, there are teenagers. And the leader was seated in the chair which every hotel room has to make it homey. And, uh, and, and, and she was great. She, she, I walked in, and, and she goes, um, okay, um, group, um, I've asked uh, Mr. Robbins if he might come in and answer some of your questions. And, and so, uh, and so uh, Shelly, why don't you tell Duffy what you told us? And so I, I, she gestures to this girl to my left, and I look over there, and sure enough, there's two girls, laying on the bed, and, and one of them obviously is kind of, her face is kind of red and swollen, puffy. She looks like she might have been crying. And, and so the youth leader says, Shelly, tell Duffy what you told us. And so this girl goes, okay. Like tonight, when you were like giving your like talk, like I didn't like that. Oh my gosh. Like it made me really uncomfortable. And, and I go, uh, oh, okay. Could you put that in the form of a question? And, and, and she's well, like, I don't know, like when you're talking about like God and stuff, and like we have to like, like obey Him, like that's like really legalistic. And, and I go, well, well, uh, Shelley, you know, what do you what do you suppose it means to love Jesus, to be one of His disciples, to to follow Him? And she goes like, well, like God like loves me, He wants me to be like happy, like He's my Abba Daddy, 
And, and, and actually, it was, a great, it was a great question, kind of, a, I mean, a good conversation. But anyway, I decided to respond to her. I'm abbreviating it. But I, I, said, I said, well, um, Shelly, let me answer you this way. And I stole a line from C.S. Lewis. I said, Shelly, here's what I think the problem is. I don't think you really want God to be your father in heaven. I think you want God to be your grandfather in heaven. See, see you want God to kind of be this senile old guy who's up there on the throne, almost able to sit up straight. And he sees us down here kind of sinning. He's like, <laughs> rascal, you know, fornicator. And, 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 and like God's big plan for the universe is that somehow at the end of the day, everybody seemed to have a swell time. I said, you know what, let me tell you something. You don't need God for happy. God's not going for it. happy. That's 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 cat video stuff. Uh, you know, happy as if you've seen this person sing backwards on TikTok. As if, God, God is not come to make you happy. God came for something so much bigger and deeper and richer and more beautiful than happy. God came for holy, for holy. You see, that, that's, that's God's good, beautiful, deep, gracious yes for us. Jesus says, if you want to experience my good and gracious yes, if you want to experience that, it's not about just me making you happy. It's about deny yourself. Deny yourself. That's the first, that's the first truth that Jesus wants us to understand. And we define this relationship of discipleship. But let's look at a second. Because in that very same verse, he defines the relationship with a second phrase. He goes on to say, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. Take up his cross daily. Anybody who's ever been in youth ministry has probably, uh, you know, done this kind of group building exercise. We have the students uh, line up in, in facing each other in kind of two lines uh, about maybe three to four feet apart. And then they hold out their arms like this, two parallel lines facing each other. And then one of the kids in the youth group comes up to a high place like this platform, turns their back to the group, and they fall backwards into the arms of the group. Maybe you've done this before, and, and the group catches them, and you use it as an invitation, an opportunity to talk about trust, right? Or you don't catch them, and you have a chance to talk about uh, betrayal and, 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 and uh, you know, the, the problem of suffering. But, but the idea is, is it reminds us that trust is an all-in relationship. Trust is an all-in relationship. It's laying it all on the line. And that's pretty much the second mark of genuine discipleship. It is an all-in relationship. When Jesus used that phrase, take up his cross, he was making a declaration to the disciples that would have been both familiar and unsettling. Because the Jews, especially in Galilee, they knew very well what the cross meant. Uh, we, we know from the Jewish historian Josephus uh, that public crucifixions were very common in that day. And typically, when someone was crucified, he was forced to carry the crossbar. It's called the, the patibulum. He was forced to carry that crossbar to the site of the execution. So when, when the disciples heard the phrase, take up his cross, they knew it wasn't just a, a burden you bore. It was not something you just carried. It, it, it was something on which you died. It's something you died on. And, and, and that's probably something we need to consider for just a minute. We, we probably need to stop and reflect on that. Because today, I don't know, it just seems like when we hear people say, oh, yeah, that's their cross to bear. You know, we might think of, uh, we might think of a heartbreak or, or, or an affliction, but we're just as likely to be referring to some kind of everyday, you know, inconvenience, just a, just a disappointment. Yeah, our hotel room, we had the garden view instead of the beach view. Uh, you know, our, yeah, we had really bad Wi-Fi, but that's just, that's just our cross to bear. It, 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 it's, it's making very, very shallow something that was very, very painful. The cross was nothing less than an instrument of death. In, in fact, you know, honestly, if Jesus were talking here this morning, uh, he might use the image of an electric chair. I mean, it was just that stark. It was the most vivid uh, way possible for Jesus to define the all-in nature of true discipleship. There are no half measures. Because, look, 
Followers of Jesus in that day, they weren't any different than, than followers of Jesus in our own day. That they wanted the miracles, that they wanted the bread and the fish, and they wanted the political power. What they did not want, what nobody wants, is the cross. And of course, we understand that. But discipleship is an all in proposition. And unfortunately, an electric chair, an electric chair is not a place where you sit down to rest. It's a place where you sit down to die. And frankly, most of us as Christians, we want something a little more pleasant, a little more suited to our pleasures, our, our preferences, our liking, kind of a, kind of a uh, Oprah goes to the Holy Land. Uh, it's something that's a little bit easier to kind of buy, a little easier to swallow. We're all, we're all in for the good stuff, uh, the fellowship, the worship, the blessed assurance, but Lord, Lord, please don't ask us to fall back into your arms. Put all of our weight, all of our hopes, all of our plans, all of our treasures, all of our choices on the promise that you will catch us. But real discipleship, it's absolute surrender. It's absolute surrender. And you know what's interesting? Luke, out of all four Gospels, uh, records that Jesus is the only one that records that Jesus added that word daily in the phrase. That he added that word daily. That the disciple of Jesus is to take up the cross daily. And, and that's a critical word because it reminds us of taking up the cross. Uh, it, it's not just a willingness to literally die for Jesus. I mean, it, it certainly would mean that. Uh, for some of the disciples who were listening to Jesus in that moment, certainly was true for Peter and also for James, the brother of John. And, and it certainly could mean that for some of Jesus' disciples today. There are some places on the planet, we're all aware of this, uh, where it very likely will this day mean precisely that. But that word daily it reminds us that the crucified life uh, is lived in the everyday choices that we make, at work, at home, uh, in our family, in our relationships, in, in, in social media. And sometimes that kind of sacrificial living can, can feel pretty painful, can be pretty, pretty cautious. Like when I, like I really want to, I'm called to say yes, but I really want to say no. Or, or when I want to say no, but I'm called to say yes. Uh, or, or when maybe meeting the needs of others means I've got to kind of adjust the way uh, I think about and prioritize my own big, beautiful needs. Or when I want to make uh, choices, I'm called to make choices that, that are disobedient to God's word. You know, it's, it's kind of worth observing here, I think, that, that earlier in this passage, it was Peter who gave the spot on answer, you are the Christ of God. His theology was great. But interesting what happened, isn't it, in the Last Supper? Remember that when Jesus looked around the room and said, guys, uh, uh, one of you is going to betray me. And they're just stung by this. It's, uh, it's almost impossible to, to believe. And, 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 and there's, I can imagine a hush, uh, almost an audible hush in the room. Everybody is just, just silent by this, except for Peter. And Peter, if you remember this, Peter kind of looks around the room, and you can imagine Peter, the rock, uh, you know, looking at these other guys and, and sort of saying, Lord, they may fall, uh, but I will not. I will not betray you. Remember what he said? He said, I'll die for you. I'll die, which is, which is fantastic. Peter is willing to die for Jesus. That's great. If, if I've been Peter's youth pastor, I'd probably go, Peter, would you share that Sunday night? I mean, this is great. Peter is willing to die for Jesus. But what happened? It wasn't even 24 hours before Jesus was denied three times, three times by Peter. And, and here's what the problem was, I think. Here's what the problem was. You see, what, what Peter did not understand is that when, when you die for somebody, you can only do that once. And typically, it will occur Right near the end of your life. And what Peter didn't seem to understand is for most of us, Jesus does not need us to die for him. You know what he needs us to do? He needs us to live for him. 
And that is a daily discipline. That is a daily commitment. That's, that's, that's the call of discipleship. That, that's what the Apostle Paul meant in, in 1 Corinthians 15, 31, when he said, I die every day. I die every day. And, and I have to say, at least from my own experience, I think that's the way you have to approach it. Because it, 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 it's not a one-time deal. You know, pray the prayer, uh, come to the altar, buy a T-shirt, uh, download a Bible app, watch the chosen. I mean, it, it's a daily discipline of trying to Say, Lord, by your power, through your Holy Spirit, I'm going to die to self. I'm going to die to self. Paul describes it. You remember this in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Not once. But over and over and over. And I really think Oswald Chambers kind of nailed it. You know, he said, here's the problem with living sacrifices. They tend to crawl off the altar. We have to take up that cross daily, daily. That's the definition of a discipleship relationship. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Which brings us then to one final question I want us to consider this morning. Why would you do it? Like, why would you do that? Why would anyone here this morning or watching online, why would anybody be willing to pay that kind of cost? Why why would anyone commit to that kind of relationship? Maybe you're sitting here going, Duffy, look, I'm I'm just a mom. I'm a a contractor. I'm a teacher. I'm I'm an eighth grade kid. I'm a college student, an Uber driver. Uh, You know, I'm I'm an investment analyst. I'm a musician. I'm I'm a programmer. Why would I commit to that kind of relationship? Well, let's go back to the text one more time, and you'll see how Jesus answered that question. Look at verse 24. Jesus said, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. You know, one of the uh, kind of favorite standard youth group camp games uh, is when you get everybody in the swimming pool and you divide them up into two teams and then you grease down a watermelon. Maybe you've seen this or played this game uh, back when you were a kid. And you tell each team that their goal is to grab that watermelon and race with it back to their end of the pool. And it's almost impossible. I mean, it's almost impossible because the harder you grab, uh, the faster it just, it just squirts away. In other words, it's, it's just exactly the opposite of what your instinct tells you to do. One of the odd paradoxes of the Christian life is this. The harder you grab, the less you grip. The harder you grab, the less you grip. Jesus said in verse 24, whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, will save it. Because the obsession in our culture is, is to find your true self, find your true self, find what really and truly brings you happiness. And then, in the words of Oprah, the only courage you ever need is the courage to live the life you want. Okay, but, but, but how does that work? When all of us, with just an ounce of self-awareness, recognize that first of all, we all have conflicting desires, right? I mean, I mean, carrot cake makes me happy, but so does not having a heart attack. So, so you know, which desires do I say no to? Which ones should I pursue? Uh, which ones are real? Oh, oh, and then what about, what about when those passions I courageously reach for remain beyond my reach? I mean, it's wonderful. It's inspiring when a billionaire media mogul tells me to be extraordinary, well, what about when my life's kind of normal? What about when I have good days and, and, and bad days and sometimes pretty bad, pretty bad, awful days? What about when my marriage is struggling? 
my career is on hold? Or what about the, when I watch the nightly news and I just get discouraged and, and fearful? You know, what about when I'm struggling as a parent? Well, what about in those times when I, I look at this stuff and I go, I'm not really sure that I'm capable. I'm not really sure what I can do to, to make it through the day. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm kind of going, oh, I know you're getting discouraged. You need to go back to Starbucks and get a pep talk. It doesn't work. It just does not cut it. And, and that's the problem with this approach. That's our problem. We live in a world that says, your life is big. Keep reaching. Jesus says, um, actually, real life isn't about reaching big. It's about a God who is way bigger than you, who so loved the world and so desired that we live an abundant life in fellowship with him, that he reached out to you. He reached out to us. Jesus states this one truth basically three different ways in this passage. He says, look, if you're going to try to save your life, trust me, you're going to lose it. You want to gain the whole world? Trust me, you're going to forfeit yourself. Turn your back on me and you will not get to see my face in glory. Most of us are probably familiar with the name Jim Elliot, the story of Jim Elliot, who along with four other missionaries lost his life taking the gospel to the Alca Indians uh, down in Ecuador. It's an amazing story. That, that book, uh, In the Shadow of the Almighty, written by his widow, Elizabeth Elliot, uh, had a profound impact on my uh, early walk with the Lord because uh, reading that book was probably the first time I really came to terms with a question that I've pretty much had to face every single day since. Am I willing? Am I willing to die for Jesus today? Or, or maybe more to the point, am I willing to die to self and live for Jesus today? And I'm pretty sure, frankly, that uh, everybody who knows me well would, would say, well, um, oh, wow, well, Duffy, I don't want to be rude, but... Um, I think you missed a few days. And they'd be right. They'd be absolutely right. And that's why this morning we cannot leave this passage without being reminded of two essential facts. Yes, it is costly to get, live for Jesus. Yes, we are called to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and die daily. But fact number one is this. Jesus has already taken up a cross on our behalf. Knowing that we're sinners, knowing that we're going to fall short, knowing that we probably will try to crawl off the altar. He shed his own blood so that we could stand before our Father and his holy angels without shame. In an act of mercy and grace that completely redefined our relationship with God, Jesus opened up to us a stunning opportunity to know life with the Father. All we have to do is truly believe it and accept it by faith. And on this Lenten Sunday morning, if you're here, you're watching online and you've never made that decision, this would be an excellent opportunity to do that. You could do that. But secondly, maybe you're sitting here going, well, yeah, but uh, it sounds really hard. This sounds really like, like serious business. I'm not sure I can do that. Well, let me assure you fact number two, you can't do it. You can't do it. I, I can't do it. Only Jesus in us by his Holy Spirit can live out this discipleship relationship the way it's intended. So again, it's, it's weird. It's kind of like once again, it's one of those upside down paradoxes. We have to empty ourselves to be full. We have to empty ourselves to be full. Paul puts it like this in Galatians 2.20. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. But it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That was precisely the choice that Jim Elliott willingly made that January day in 1956 when he and his buddies touched down their little uh, Piper aircraft on a sandbar in the Coray River at a place they sort of nicknamed Palm Beach and then waited expectantly to share the gospel with these people who had never, ever heard it before. And three days later, three days later, they were all dead. They were all dead, viciously attacked 
by the very tribe they hoped to reach. And of course, when that news got back to the States, people were asking the question, was it worth it? You know, these five young men, husbands, uh, fathers, friends, just, just gone. What Was it a price too high to pay? And I can tell you this. I can tell you this unequivocally. Jim Elliott would have had no doubt about the answer to that question. And we know this because they found in his journal these words written decisively in Jim's steady hand. And you can almost wonder as you read these words, had he recently read these very verses we studied this morning in Luke chapter 9? Because listen to what he wrote. He wrote this. He is no fool. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Men and women, brothers and sisters in Christ, remember that it comes down to this question. Who do you say? Who do you say that I am? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this stunning invitation to live life with you. We do not deserve it. We cannot earn it. It's strictly a matter of grace. We know, Lord, that you have already, you have already made this incredible sacrifice for us. You've already taken up the cross. And you didn't crawl away that day on Calvary. So I pray this morning, Father, that you would give us by your Holy Spirit that that reminder that we are invited into this incredible relationship, this magnificent yes, by falling back into your arms with complete all-in trust. We pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.